So thank you all. I think I shall now make a start as it's just gone two o'clock. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel. I'm Rachel Morgan, the Director of Engagement here at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. So therefore I have the very great privilege of being part of our executive team. And on behalf of all of us in the team, we welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. Today, we have a really interesting topic, as I'm sure you're well aware, which is nursing as a feminist profession. And in just a few minutes, I will hand over to Leanne Patrick, who's very kindly given her time today to tell us more about this field. But before I do that, just a couple of housekeeping duties, um, which is firstly to say, as you might have noticed, this session is currently being recorded. If for any reason you have any issue with that, please do contact the team. So either myself or Adam or Jess or Charlie, we're all part of the team here at FNF on the screen now. So please do direct messages if there's any issue for you in that. What I should also say is straight after the session, you will be sent an email which will include an evaluation and we'd be absolutely thrilled if you could please uh, fill that in and give us your feedback. Also, you will receive a link to the webinar um, and that will be up shortly, maybe in the next couple of days on our platform. So please do keep an eye out for that. And if there's somebody who was due to attend today that you're aware of who's missed it, please do feel free to share the link with them so that they can also listen in in future. But without further ado, we shall leap into the reason you're all here today and why we're very delighted to welcome you, which is that Leanne has joined us, Leanne Patrick, to talk to us about nursing as a feminist profession. And in terms of the content, what you'll hear more about today is that Leanne will explore the history of nursing, attitudes towards women and nursing through the years. And in turn, then she'll examine how these things have shaped some of the modern issues that we face as a profession and how indeed they translate into women's health outcomes. And by way of an introduction to Leanne, she is a gender based violence nurse specialist who works with survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence in the NHS. She develops and delivers education and training both locally and nationally to support healthcare professionals to identify and safeguard victims of gender-based violence. Leanne is interested in women's inequality within health and social care systems. She is also a member of the Joint World Health Organization and Women in Global Health Network's Gender Equity Hub. So we are very delighted to welcome Leanne today, as I've said. And just before I do hand across to Leanne, I wanted to also make you aware that please do, if you like, ask questions. And the way we tend to um, do that here at FNF is if you could please pop those in the chat. When we come to the end of Leanne's presentation, I will then put those to Leanne. So please do keep the questions coming. But for now, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Leanne, and um, I hope you all very much enjoy. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you. Thank you very much <clears throat> and thank you for that kind introduction as well. Um, as mentioned, I'm Leanne Patrick, I'm a gender-based violence nurse specialist uh, and I work in NHS Scotland. I'm going to be speaking for about 40 minutes today and as mentioned there'll be time to kind of go through questions at the end so please just pop those uh, in the chat. And I'd like to also start by just thanking you all for coming along to this webinar today and also to the Florence Nightingale Foundation for uh, hosting it. I've given this presentation once before um, and each time it's been really, really popular. So that tells me that there's a real appetite for these sorts of discussions within nursing. And that's something I've suspected may be the case for some time. My aim is to keep this as accessible as possible. So I'm speaking, I understand, with an academic expert audience, uh, students, register, registrants and academics. But some of these concepts um, may be new to some of you. And for others, it may be, you know, treading well-worn ground. But I want them to be clear. My goal is to trace what's often, I think, an invisible uh, thread connecting different experiences and phenomena together and to get people to think a little bit differently about what it means to be uh, a woman in nursing in 2022 and also women as patients. How it is that we kind of came to be here and some of the social forces that we are coming up against as a largely female workforce and I'll just say as well before I start that I do have a bit of a cough so if I go quiet for a couple of seconds it's so that I don't uh, deafen you all with my cough so uh, hopefully we should be fine, but just so, you know, if I go somewhere. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to jump straight into this and begin by outlining the gendered history of nursing and how we're still feeling the effects of that today, uh, of what came before us. 
So the provision of healthcare was not always as we see it today, where it largely is at the hands of women. In fact, women throughout history um, have, where they provided care, it was often the case that they were regarded with suspicion as witches uh, and mystical healers, uh, and they're often aligned to the spiritual through religious orders. And we still see relics of this today where nurses are described as, as angels. The idea is that there's something inherent to the nature of women, good or bad, that leads them to care for others. And where men have provided care, uh, they were instead quite highly respected in their communities and their knowledge and skill was often the focus. There's some evidence dating back to 250 BC that the first nursing schools were actually founded and populated by men in India. And their history of field medicine prior to the professionalization of physicians is quite clear. Where they diverged from respected nurses uh, and into respected medics is less clear, but the concurrent timeline of women from healer to carer and later to nurse provides us with a bit of insight into what might have happened there. So when women first came to be recognised as nurses, they were not afforded the same respect as their male forebears. The evolution of women from carers or healers to nurses happened in two places, religious orders and in communities and homes. And hands-on care was regarded quite widely as being dirty, unhygienic work for lower class women who looked out for family members, um, who shared acquired knowledge and wisdom within their communities, or they were holy women doing their godly duty by caring for the sick. This idea of nursing as lowly, unskilled labour was later cemented as medicine became professionalised and led to further decline in the status of nurses, since medicine was for educated men and nursing was for uneducated women. And these two professions have been, uh, and to this day, compared very unfavourably. And it was actually doctors who were exclusively men operating within a patriarchal society that allowed them education opportunities that were not uh, necessarily available for women. It was actually doctors who were key in perpetuating the poor image of, of women nurses in many ways. And these attitudes very much reflected the status of women and the significant imbalance of power, respect and opportunities between the sexes. I provided a quote here. Um, from a Dr. J.B. Russell, who was the medical superintendent of Glasgow Municipal, Municipal Hospital in the mid 19th century. And his view um, um, was far from unique actually. In fact, it was very widely held by the medical establishment. And this view helped to popularize an image uh, of nurses amongst the wider public. And some of you might recognize this image here of Mrs. Gamp from um, the Charles Dickens novel. And Mrs. Gamp was a nurse uh, and portrayed in the novel as sloppy, drunken, an older woman who was generally incompetent. She was actually based upon apparently a real nurse that Dickens knew of at the time, but she very much portrayed this kind of popular image of um, that, the, that the British public held about nurses at the time in the Victorian era before the Nightingale reforms. And we might think this is quite shocking today, but this woman and nurses like her were quite a bit more fortunate actually uh, than the women and carers and healers who came before them. Had they been alive during the witch trials, for example, where women healers were commonly regarded uh, as witches, there is a very strong possibility they would have been killed. And again, this seems quite shocking. And we imagine we've moved on quite significantly because it was such a long time ago. But we're currently as close in time to the Victorian era as they were to the witch trials. And really, again, it's this invisible thread that I'm thinking of that we can trace from then to now into the modern day that is worth just keeping in the back of your minds as we kind of go through this presentation. So we have a very clear picture of how women nurses were viewed and how very different this was than the way male nurses were viewed before them. And this again is important to keep in mind because it remains very relevant today. But it should start to become clear that men essentially graduated to medicine and women were effectively relegated to nursing. Which brings us on to Florence Nightingale and the Nightingale reforms. And, and Florence is something of a divisive figure in modern nursing. And it's quite serendipitous to be uh, speaking about this via the Florence Nightingale Foundation. But to some, Florence is the face of modern nursing. Um, but to others, she represents exclusion, a kind of progress for middle class women that comes at the expense of lower class black and minority women. 
It's my contention that she was all of those things. Ultimately, she played a key role in the professionalization of nursing, taking it from the fringes of healthcare to an educated and regulated profession. After the First World War, the need for nurses was also cemented and respect for the profession improved somewhat. But all of this progress was not without difficulty. It was won despite strong opposition from many medics and indeed from leading members of the clergy who were at that time political figures and community leaders. Um, and like many women's rights, it was a brokered deal, something done in baby steps. It was given to women, not rightfully claimed or organically evolved as with med and medicine. Women didn't have the power to make those sorts of decisions, and they often made them within the context of a society that was designed and dictated by men. So Nightingale was a mirror for the era she lived in, and for a long time, professional nurses were white, middle-class women, and the expectations of them were high, with lingering religious ideologies. Nurses were to be unmarried, childless, um, if they were to be committed truly to their vocation, and that legacy still casts a long shadow over our profession today. Arguably, it's far easier to be a nurse in 2022 if you are all of those things still. Another criticism that has emerged in the wake of recent men in nursing recruitment campaigns is this notion of Nightingale as a power powerful matriarch who excluded men from nursing. She did famously say that uh, men were not suited to nursing. And uh, an increasing number of male academics and proponents of these campaigns contend that it's partly to blame for the current low numbers of men in the profession to this day. But history teaches us a very different story about the evolution of nursing and Nightingale, though influential, was still a woman in Victorian Britain and one who was operating within a highly patriarchal culture where social roles were highly gendered and bound to the social and moral order of the time. She was essentially uh, operating within the limits laid out for her by men. Which brings us on to quite nicely to the modern day. So I suppose, where are we now? Do we now live in a post-feminist society now that we've won the vote, now that we can choose to work in just about any profession we like? Now we've had three female prime ministers in England and supposedly benefit from endless equality laws, policies and strategies. I think we all know that the answer to that is no. Um, we do not live uh, in a post-feminist society. And in fact, wherever you sit on the political spectrum and regardless of your personal feminist values, most can agree that women's rights are still very much under fire. Some of you may come to this um, with a sense of that they are fought for. Some of you may believe that these are still in reality brokered deals. Whatever your view or take, I want to start out this next bit um, by sharing a truism or some of you might recognize it as Newton's third law, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And what I mean by this in this context is that for every bit of progress that women make, there is a concerted backlash against that progress. So we understand patriarchy as an organized system of male dominance that maintains that, that dominance over women and ensures either no or partial rights for women as the subjugated class. So we can trace this kind of back to when women first won the vote. The backlash was really clear and very organized. Women were divided and are to this day along generational lines. We had the young, cool and in the know women and the old has been silly old mummies. And that was a capitalist effort that pitched new, exciting and modern technologies specifically at younger women with the message that smart women could live better than their mothers and their female ancestors whose values were outdated, dull and less educated than their own. And this essentially assured that uh, women who had successfully organised and pulled together to achieve the vote were no longer quite so together. And we see this playing out now in the battle lines drawn between different waves of feminists and their differing beliefs and how corporate entities capitalize upon those divisions. So as we move through the next section and the rest of this webinar, I'd like you just to keep that context in the back of your mind. Um, and so thinking about where that leaves us in nursing today, for one, it pitches us almost obsessively against the likes of Florence and our female forebears as dusty old uneducated matrons. And our focus in nursing is so rarely on the male dominated history of our subjugation that the literature on it is all but non-existent. 
But it is woven into the structure of nursing and nurse education. Our lack of clear focus on this issue facilitates in a female majority profession, seemingly endless streams of academic editorials that position men in nursing as an oppressed minority in this profession. And that's against all evidence to the contrary. It also positions us against each other, a hierarchy than a hierarchy in which women will pull up the ladder um, from under them uh, and oppress each other in order to survive and thrive within nursing. It's a common saying in nursing that um, we eat our young. And this is true. Nurse education is an obstacle course that weeds out everyone but the most committed, ruthless and privileged amongst us. It's still easier to be a nurse, as I said, if you are single, if you're child free, um, and it asks more of us than it should. By the time we arrive as registrants, many of us are already somewhat battle scarred and thrown in at the deep end, something of a baptism of fire many people often find themselves describing it as it's a constant state of having to earn your place and fight for it and our focus is naturally shaped inward by all of this onto ourselves onto each other rather than towards the focus at uh, the forces that drive and shape and uh, maintain the status quo our unions are repeatedly uh, telling us that nurses are not engaging that our ballot turnouts are low and this is to some extent inevitable on this current trajectory. What is done tends to be done to us as a profession and without our input because we are a majority female workforce still subjugated on the basis of being female. This is brought, I think, into particularly sharp focus by the relationship between male registrants and the nursing profession. So over the past few years, there's been, as I've mentioned, a strong effort to recruit more men into the profession. And this is often pitched to us as a way of solving our staffing deficit. But this isn't actually accurate since we're not struggling to fill uh, university spaces. And the evidence actually shows that men are more likely to leave the course and the profession. So there's technically a risk that without proper consideration, these sorts of campaigns may worsen the situation. Um, but they're also pitched as an equality movement. And we consistently see a narrative that positions men as an oppressed minority in the profession, as being missed from nursing, as being needed, and also as being put off from considering nursing due to the image of it being too feminine or according to some research, puffy. Um, and the stigma this causes, uh, which I'll unpack uh, in a moment, but research from sociology also finds that these narratives um, doubly benefit men. So firstly, they benefit from the already privileged position within society as the dominant class. And then again, by creating concern that men need help in nursing, despite being paid more on average than their female peers, and despite them progressing faster, further, and with fewer qualifications. So whilst there definitely is a case to be made for the normalization of men as nurses, and also the visibility of men in the profession to achieve that normalization in wider society, what it requires from us is sensitive handling and an understanding of nursing's history, and in particular women's subjugation within that history, so that we're not repeating that history or maintaining it. Unfortunately, we currently aren't seeing this from the majority of campaigns and from the editorials and data analyses coming out of nursing academia. And what's very often missing is this feminist lens, this um, appreciation for what has been done to women and what is still being done to women. And women who uh, disagree with this are often positioned as unkind, anti-progress, bullies, overly dominant, bringing us back to the ways in which women are divided under patriarchy. You're either with us and cool and nice and pleasant or against us and pass it, past it and uh, an unpleasant person. And I say this with a degree of generosity. Misogyny and patriarchy are within all of us to some degree. It's how we're socialized, which is why the feminist lens is really important. It helps us to think carefully about the things that we know and understand about the world um, and the social world that women navigate. So when we hear that you know, nursing carries a stigma for being too feminine or puffy. <laughs> um, a feminist lens gives us the opportunity to inquire and dig a bit deeper rather than just accepting these sorts of statements at face value. So asking questions like, what does it mean that something's too feminine? What's wrong with being gay or being seen as being gay? Uh, why would this be so off-putting to men? What is wrong with being seen as feminine unless it's somehow a bad thing to be? And why would it carry stigma unless again, there's something inherently wrong with being feminine? 
Um, so I mentioned just a minute ago about the sensitive handling uh, of men in nursing campaigns, and then invite you to look at these two images. Um, the first is a male nursing academic in Scotland who launched a men in nursing campaign, and the second was a student nurse at the time who featured in an NHS England men in nursing recruitment campaign. And these are examples of um, highly visible, you know, national press, national television advertisements of nursing to men. And I want you to notice the common themes of heteronormative masculinity. So in the first, we see this man who um, is described as having been a professional boxer. Um, they also detail that he fathered four children. So there's these kind of concepts of very masculine, virile man. Um, and uh, in the second, the clip shows men playing football, running through a busy A&E and posing in like these crossed arm power stances. And you can see the student is quoted in this part as saying, we're not embarrassed by our work, even though nobody asks him about this or suggests this throughout. So it's, it's almost like, who are you trying to prove this to? Uh, and once again, these messages are kind of projected out to stereotypically masculine men. And there's, so, there's a couple of points that I want to make about this before moving on to the next part. And it's that these campaigns are attempting to shift the image of nursing as feminine by kind of forcing masculinity into the picture. And this very kind of traditional hetero, heteronormative idea of masculinity, which not only you know, ignores the misogyny inherent in the idea of femininity as a negative thing that men must kind of avoid uh, and as somehow lesser than masculinity, but it actually reinforces these stereotypes about femininity and masculinity and projects the idea that you are either this kind of masculine or you are feminine. And they fail to challenge the assumptions men have about gender and ultimately find themselves pandering to the misogynistic attitudes of those who aren't actually interested in nursing. So I often wonder, is it really those men that we wish to charm into the profession? And do we really think this is the best way to smash stereotypes and end stigma? The stigma of being a gender non-conforming non man is perpetuated by these men into nursing campaigns uh, when they start using these tactics. Um, tactics that arise from essentially uncritically accepting and acting on the word of those men who see nursing as too feminine and ignoring the experience of women, nurses and men who don't fit this kind of um, stereotypical heteronormative image of masculinity. Um, but where men do experience stigma, it's often by proximity to women, not nursing or even femininity. Not all women are feminine, but their work is highly gendered due to the very kind of stereotypes uh, that these campaigns seek to dismantle yet ultimately reinforce. So we've sort of, sort of traced the history of nursing through to the present and what we're left with is the understanding that nursing care is regarded as women's work and that women's work is of low value and somehow lesser. But it's not that the work itself is underpaid and undervalued. There's nothing inherently female about nursing, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it, it was once highly respected and where men were the only nurses. The reality is that any work women do is underpaid and undervalued because women are still seen as the subordinate social class. And a good example of this is computing and IT jobs. And this, um, these were once really very poorly paid and undervalued. And it was mostly women doing the job when this was the case. It was thought of as low skilled secretarial work. Um, and it was almost exclusively women working in IT and computing to begin with. But as more men came into these types of jobs, the pay and the prestige increased. And now IT and computing are male dominated professions. They're highly paid uh, and computing is now recognized as a science, something we struggle to achieve recognition of uh, in nursing. So over and over again, the common theme here and the message that we're receiving is that it doesn't matter what women do, it's women as a social class who are undervalued, no matter what profession or industry they work in. This means that it isn't nursing itself that's undervalued. In fact, the evidence suggests that the picture would be very different if it were a majority male profession. We might imagine that um, it could have followed a similar trajectory to that of medicine in terms of prestige, pay, education, investment, because this is certainly the case in all male dominated STEM professions. The image of nursing then is inevitably shaped by these ideas. It's undervalued, it's under-resourced, and it continues to be compared unfavorably with medicine. This 
ultimately means that nurses have less power and influence within health policy um, and within service design and also development. It also presents some of these sort of interesting quirks in feminist thinking that we see. So I often see tweets about female doctors um, lamenting being referred to as a nurse. And as inevitably happens, a few nurses apply to ask why this is such a bad thing and they're quickly kind of labelled insensitive trolls. But the common narrative seems to hold that assuming female doctors or nurses is sexism. And whilst this is true to a degree, it is also fair to ask why being mistaken as a nurse is problematic. Um, and then what's going on when people assume that man equals doctor and woman equals nurse? It's these gendered assumptions um, uh, and they don't just communicate that certain people do certain roles in an arbitrary way, but that female people in particular couldn't possibly have prestigious jobs like medicine and instead must have lesser jobs and nursing is that lesser job. So it's interesting to watch how nurses are treated when they try to touch on this. Um, it's framed as unfeminist. And once again, we cycle back to that old tactic of dividing women. You're either with us and a true feminist defending female doctors who have worked hard to earn their status, which by the way is deservedly higher than yours as a nurse and you mustn't complain, or you're against us and not a good enough feminist. And often this is very much an unconscious behavior because it's part of our socialization as children and it's reinforced and rewarded throughout our lives. That's how patriarchy maintains itself. And this is particularly true within healthcare, where gender dynamics are very prominent within the medical hierarchy. The result of these various external forces, amongst others that deserve entire webinars of their own, um, is a profession that's divided from within. The effect of that is that we have no coherent sense of professional identity. And if we look across the various branches in the UK, we find uh, it's next to impossible to define nursing identity in a way that cuts across them all. But more than this, we don't share a common sense of who we are, and that means we often lack a strong sense of shared purpose. So it becomes easier to have identity narratives imposed upon us, and it's easier for movements like men in nursing to take hold and begin to form individual identity groups because we're already so fractured. It also makes us vulnerable to some of the angel and hero narratives we've seen throughout the pandemic, which keeps us in something of a, a catch-22. And these external narratives weaken our sense of professional identity and our lack of um, professional identity therefore ensures that these narratives continue. And this may on the surface seem like a purely academic issue, but if we are still seen as women fulfilling their godly duties, then we still lack political power, influence uh, and respect. Angels don't need a good salary, nor do they need a degree, so it keeps us locked into place where we're underpaid, under-resourced and understaffed. And the pandemic brought this duality of being essential whilst being undervalued into quite sharp focus. And we can ultimately trace all of this back to simply how we are viewed and, and how we view ourselves. Uh, and the consequences of under-resourcing and understaffing are dire for patients, uh, as we know, which is why strike action is on some level uh, a form of feminist activism. So, um, we've come to understand a few things. One, that women are the subjugated class within a patriarchal society that organizes and maintains male dominance. Two, that women are subjugated as uh, healthcare professionals within a patriarchal healthcare system that has both historically and presently privileged men uh, and medicine. And three, that even within nursing, a profession that is majority female, women are disadvantaged when compared with their male peers. And the underlying reason for all of this, of course, being that it is women, regardless of their work, who are not valued. The consequences of this are far reaching, insidious, and they're also woven into the daily lives of women's realities. Women are paid less, they have fewer opportunities, and women nurses are statistically more likely to complete suicide than their non-nursing peers than men in nursing or than any other healthcare profession. The oppressive forces experienced by women in nursing are numerous, both external and sadly also internal. But if we come to what does unite nurses and our shared aims of providing good quality, safe uh, and effective nursing care to the people in our communities, then we also see how this affects patient care. I touched on the practical effects of image and our weak identity, but our lack of power is particularly acute in the area of women's healthcare. 
it won't come as a surprise to any of you that um, all of these things, again, have practical implications for patient care and women's health in particular. So there are numerous studies that suggest that women's outcomes are, on average, worse when cared for by male physicians. We know that women's heart attack symptoms um, are have historically not been very well understood and that medicine and medical research is typically based around an understanding of the default male body where women are regarded as too complicated and complex to study or the other essentially. We're also starting to get a sense of the disparities in pain manage from the recent campaigns to review provision of pain medication during gynae procedures but we very rarely look to women for an understanding of their experiences within health um, I regularly use Care Opinion um, as a platform to look at independent feedback of healthcare services, and the gynae feedback is consistently hair raisingly awful. I've um, included an example here of an excerpt and would encourage you all to take a look at Care Opinion if you would like to get you know, women's perspectives and feedback of how well we're caring for women in health. Um, and my own master's research looked very specifically at women's experiences of disclosing domestic abuse and sexual violence to healthcare staff. It was the only one of its kind, which is great for a master's student looking for a good thesis, but actually quite shocking when we consider that at least a third of women will experience this kind of abuse and worse, given um, that a World Health Organization multi-country uh, study found that male violence is the leading contributor to death, disease and disability in women aged 18 to 44. So we're seeing these women every single day in healthcare and we're consistently failing to safeguard them. Um, and we're also failing to build trauma-informed services and we're generally ignoring that this is an issue at all, despite knowing that these women are more likely to require health care than their peers and despite the strain that unmanaged trauma places upon the health of individuals and the system um, as a whole. And sadly, my research found that women disclosing abuse to healthcare staff is an almost universally awful and traumatic experience. From, it ranges from not being believed uh, to being blamed uh, and even to having their consent ignored and being re-traumatized. Um, and I want to tell you just two stories from the feedback that I was, uh, went through that really stood out to me and that illustrate just how badly we're failing women. Um, the first was a story, sorry, I think my battery is running low, which is untimely. One second and I'll just plug you in. Hopefully we can edit that from the, the recording footage. You can all take a little break from me speaking while I clunkily plug in. We're, we're, really dis we're all used to want... tech issues. Well, um, <laughs> I think that's just sorted now. I don't want to disappear on you partway through these uh, important stories. So that should be us sorted. So the first story was told by a woman's daughter after her death. Um, and this woman was admitted to the ICU after an accident that her daughter suspected was caused by her abuser, a man who she'd separated from many months previously, um, but who had harassed and stalked her ever since. This man was her ex-husband and he was allowed to make decisions related to her care whilst her family were not informed of her accident or her hospital stay until after she was dead. And the second story is of a woman who disclosed to gynae staff that she'd been raped some years previously and that she wanted only female staff to be involved in her procedure, which is a really common request for victims of sexual trauma and something I consistently found in my own research. However, when she awoke from the procedure, it was to a room filled with healthcare staff and two male physicians examining her genitals. Um, she was also stripped naked by staff and helped to dress in the same room whilst in recovery. And these stories are really shocking and jarring. And we probably imagine that they must be rare, but how do we actually know this? Because we wouldn't personally do this because we haven't seen it with our own eyes. Um, but every day on social media, women are asking for trauma-informed care uh, and sharing their stories of re-traumatization, almost pleadingly to kind of get us to do something about it. Nearly every day, they share their feedback on Care Opinion as well, the only site to make these stories publicly available. It's my contention that this isn't rare at all and that healthcare, like every other industry, frequently causes harm to women, whether they are staff or patients. And this is because, um, 
we have not yet even begun to scratch the surface of these issues and understanding them, let alone um, getting to the point of formulating strategic actions to address them. Efforts, where they do exist, are often very piecemeal. So what do we do about all of this? First, uh, I think it isn't in the gift of victims to fix their own oppression, but we can certainly, um, you know, we certainly won't move forward if we don't know what it is that we're looking at, what it is that we're up against, what we're fighting for, or what it is that we're brokering deals to achieve. My intention is to bring this to the attention of nurses so that we can begin to develop a shared understanding of what it means to be a woman in nursing today uh, and a woman accessing healthcare today, how it is that we got here and the things that we might be inadvertently complicit in. And I know, as I said earlier, that I'm speaking with a diverse group with differing ideas about how we do this work together, different perspectives on what is right or fair or just. But if we can at least focus on our shared aims, be more alert to how we might be complicit in weaponizing misogyny against our peers or ignoring its influence in patient care, then we might have a greater chance of resisting it. We might have a greater chance of coming together, developing a stronger identity if we have a consistent understanding of our common experiences and a truly informed uh, shared sense of purpose. So this is an invitation to keep having these discussions, to bring a feminist lens to your work in clinical practice, in management, in policy and nurse education. This is very simply an invitation to feminism. Thank you. So I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was fantastic. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's felt by everybody in the room. And even though it's virtual, I feel like there would be a virtual round of applause if we could without kind of making Zoom crash a bit. But um, thank yeah, you. thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, we do have a question to kick us off, although I thought it's also worth noting that thank you, Diana. And I'm so sorry, I don't know your first name, but J.L. Pendle, who's noted that there's lots of nodding furiously going on, Leanne, as you're speaking there, because people Great. really um, completely understand and concur with what you're saying. So J.L. Pendle had the first question, which is that, say, firstly, they're completing their thesis on men in midwifery at the moment. I'm wondering if you have any comments on the differences between narratives of the missing and needed male nurse and the absence of this narrative until very recently in midwifery, please. I think there's probably quite a bit of parallel. So my own mum is actually a, a midwife and has been for many years. And I know that the number of male midwives is very, very, very low. Um, but I think it's roughly comparable, I would say, to what we're seeing in nursing just now. Once it kind of gets onto people's radars, it's really common these days to have this idea of men as an oppressed marginalized minority in these professions and that diversity efforts is how we should kind of focus this and actually if we look to things like Athena Swan they very specifically mention balance of men in the professions in the same way that uh, they have for women in STEM it's treated as like a comparable issue when it very much isn't and so just as in nursing male midwives will be absolutely benefiting from that narrative. And what we tend to see as well is that in order to redress this balance and to have this visibility, the handful of nurses who are men are automatically placed on a kind of podium and pedestal and given all this attention, regardless of how hard they've worked. You know, it's an automatic advantage in many ways that we've seen in the kind of sociology research that I've been looking at. This idea that we must give men this focus and this attention to redress the balance, but there are significant um, unintended consequences of that, I would say. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Leanne. We've got a couple more questions and comments, if I might, please. So that yes. we've got a comment from Aurora, um, just to say that they were shocked to hear some of the stories, but I'm, I'm as appalled as when I've heard, first heard things elsewhere. And, and in that sense, Aurora says that they would love to have further resources or suggested research on these issues, if possible, please. With that, I'm sure you'll be able to help pinpoint us in some directions after today's webinar, Leanne. So we'll perhaps follow that up with you afterwards, if that's okay. 
yeah maybe get something out in an email that might be helpful but I really would encourage everybody to look at care opinion it's um I, I always talk about care opinion. I don't have shares in care opinion I just think it's a really great resource because it's feedback that's transparent you know it's not held by the NHS they don't collect it themselves it's an independent source so and it's anonymous as well so people can give a really honest account without worrying that they're going to get poor care as a result of being honest and it's really consistent across the board. If you just even look at gynae procedures, overwhelmingly awful, the experience of women. And so I think it's a great place to start just by listening to what women are telling us about their care. Thank you so much. Leanne, I can see we've got a question, a hand up from Kuei Wang. If I don't mind asking to um, unmute yourself and ask the question, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Oh, I have a question because now uh, just I uh, put on my hand to have some questions about the uh, excellent uh, presentation because uh, thank, you. The, uh, thank you. The speaker uh, says that um, you, you said uh, uh, now in the in the world, the female just uh, the female students just to show some uh, less power of identity or less um, professional uh, method or these kind of things but i think maybe there are some uh, i don't have the same uh, thinkings about that because uh, you know in china china is a, 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 a country which is not have any freedom but the uh, data uh, collected by government chinese government shows that uh, from uh, last year uh, the number of the female students who have entered the university is more than the uh, male enter uh, um, the number of the male students entering the university and not only the professional but also other aspects in China have some uh, have some uh, uh, phenomenon that shows the uh, uh, women's status is improving day by day so uh, this is uh, the phenomenon that happens in the country. Uh, we know China does, doesn't have any freedom, but it, uh, also, you know, in other countries, uh, such as in the Western countries, England, uh, other countries are very, you, you know, very have the speaking freedom, these kind of things. I think the uh, female have the more uh, possibilities to get better. So. I don't think <laughs> just showing that uh, female have some uh, the impressed, uh, the, you know, the some Im images coming from the uh, less power of the identity. I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I think you make some good points about, you know, I focus very much on Western society and I think you make good points about how things are different in other parts of the world. It's certainly the case that um, where women are more unequal uh, in other countries, um, that will manifest as well in their professional lives too. So I think we certainly have some advantages in the West um, and women, obviously, you know, we see directors of nursing, we see um, women progressing, but we still definitely have statistically those imbalances. So it's not that there are lots and lots of men um, dominating these roles. It's that statistically and proportionately they're overrepresented. But I do definitely agree that we're in a stronger position here than some other people may well be in, in, in other parts of the world. Thanks, Leanne. We've got a few more comments for you. Many to, take, to say just a big thank you um, for such a great and thought-provoking insight, including uh, Claire says that she's doing her PhD at the moment, and thanks for doing the work you've been and continuing to do. And um, Then Marion has commented about the NHS Women's Health Strategy, which seems to medicalise women's health, such as turning the menopause into something to treat rather than a life course experience that needs to changes to work practices as well as medication. Um, and she says, how can we have the feminist lens being used in policy too? I think it's interesting because there's, there's, there's different ways of looking at this. Um, and my first instinct really is to say that that's not what nursing care really is. You know, this, and I think nursing is becoming increasingly medicalized in this attempt to make it more respectable, more like medicine, rather than valuing nursing care for what it actually is, which is, you know, the kind of 
the kind of care that we provide to people, the coordination of care, the risk management, the oversight of so many different aspects of a person's needs and care. It's a much more, it's a much it's a much different paradigm than medicine. And what we consistently see in these approaches that are intended to, to do well and do better are these kind of medical lenses. And, and we still exist very much, as I mentioned, in this medical hierarchy where medicine is still regarded as the better of the two professions, the more respected, the more robust, the more educated, rather than actually an entirely different profession um, with entirely different um, you know, an entirely different paradigm. You know, the care provided by nurses is not remotely the same as the care provided by uh, medics. And the closer we try to get to that, the more we undermine what it is that nurses do. And in essence, I think that is very much a, a feminist issue. So I think taking a feminist lens to that is recognition of why that's happening, the undervaluing of nursing care, nursing skills, because it's historically and traditionally uh, a predominantly female profession um, with those skills. I hope that answers the question. Marion, I can see you popped your camera on. Did you want to say anything further there? Um, thank you. Hi, Leanne. Um, I, I agree with all that. That's my challenge is that we are um, taking that medical and male lens on, on, our, on our policies still, rather than um, being able to shift that to um, a sort of full range of ways of knowing in nursing and ways of being in nursing and with such a predominantly female profession and so many um, of my age now coming to needing workforce um, the workforce challenges and you know concessions in work it's it's repeating the same as we did with maternity that this is a, a bit of an odd situation for women to be in the workforce as opposed to a normal way of developing a workforce um, strategy and for nurses as the most um, in terms of numbers and women in nursing as the most in numbers this is a, a fundamental policy lens that I'm interested in as well but thank you Leanne it, it can't be answered in here I'm just no it's it's complicated and I share your frustrations you know there's there's a balance for me one is the what do we need from our leaders you know, our chief nursing officers, what do we need them to know about this issue to be able to communicate and advocate from the top down? I think that needs to be something that we think very carefully about. But I'm also mindful that our chief nursing officers are women in a very male dominated environment. So I think my intention and hope is that the more we start to have these conversations and recognize what it is that we're looking at here, the more we can start to move in the right direction, which is inevitably a slow and clunky process but I'm hopeful because the appetite is here to come to these presentations the appetite for the discussions is there it's just not always possible for us to without coming to these kinds of conversations and places start to connect the dots which I think is really important thanks Leanne and, and Marion that was brilliant thank you yeah and we've got a question now from Caroline who's noting that she's heard many anecdotal an accounts of women being shamed or derided for requesting same-sex care and the recent case of a woman whose procedure was cancelled by a private hospital for specifically requesting same-sex not same-gender care and Caroline asks what are your thoughts on this please? So my background is I'm a mental health nurse, I'm a gender-based violence nurse, I work with survivors of sexual violence all the time and you know my research as well has looked at women's experiences navigating healthcare systems as survivors. And it's very consistently the same thing that women ask for. They ask for female clinicians, they ask for female staff. And here in Scotland as well, the, um, the legislation recently for um, forensic medical examinations very specifically um, refers to being able to select the sex of the staff member who will be doing the examination, not the gender. For me, from a, from a, a trauma-centered and trauma-focused lens, I think it's really important to honor the respect uh, and respect the requests of the 
the patient. The power dynamic is always going to be weighted in our favour uh, and the balance is always with us as clinicians and staff members. And I don't think it would ever be right for any of us to want to impose ourselves on another person who would be traumatised by our presence. And that's just the nature of trauma. People, you know, it doesn't have any rhyme or reason or logic. People just feel how they feel. And it really tends to be when it comes to traumatised women that we get this wrong. And I find this debate and discussion really interesting in terms of how quick we are to tell women to be nice, be quiet, to accept what's being asked of them. Rather than looking at the actual reality of what trauma looks like, we may be causing somebody unintended trauma. We may be causing somebody to become so traumatized that they don't come back to us for healthcare in the future. We need to build that trust and we need to build that um, with women in particular who often have really poor experiences. So it would always be my um, belief to honour the requests of any person when it comes to their experience of trauma. Thanks, Leanne, that was great. And a further question now from Diana. Thank you, Diana, which is, Leanne, how do you see the role of the women's staff network groups in the NHS organisation in adopting the feminism lens to changing care systems and processes? I think it would be really helpful. It has potential. But I think often these things tend to become very siloed and separate. And this is a women's group. The women will be handling this. It would be great if we could have something that's more embedded and woven through the policy that we have. But I think it's inevitable at this stage of the game that we need to have people who specifically focus on that in health systems, in our unions, in the Royal College. We need specific groups of women with this expertise to come together to send to women's voices and talk about these issues. So I think they have potential. But my con concern is always that we're doing, we're doing enough. We've got this women's group. Let's leave them to it. So I think it just needs to be the delivery. I think the delivery is always going to be um, the important aspect of that. Thanks, Leanne. And thank you all so much for your comments in the chat. We'll try and get through them all. And um, we do have another question from Shelley, which is, do our chief nurses need to apply some of this and challenge the MOs when actually at the table most of us are unable to sit at? Yeah, I think I kind of mentioned something about that a little bit earlier, actually, that I think it's it needs to come from the top down. It makes it much easier for the rest of us if the message is coming from above hierarchy kind of language of hierarchy but you know if it's being challenged at the top then it makes it easier for those of us on the front line or elsewhere to to kind of be able to enact that as well but I recognize as well that we you know that our chief, chief nursing officers are in these very male dominated environments that it can be challenging that their voices aren't necessarily heard so I think it needs to be about acts of courage sometimes to be able to talk about that it would be really good to hear from chief nurses about those experiences Oh, we've lost your sound, Leanne, or I have. I'm not sure if that's the case for everyone else. Do you mind? Oh, I think we have. No, can't hear you. Let me just see a few other. No, sorry. No. Oh, so sorry, everybody. Slight technical glitch. We've only got a few more minutes, Leanne, so I don't know if we'll manage to get you back. Afraid not. Do you mind then, Leanne, whilst you just see if we can get sound back a set, I just thought I'd respond to Ali's comment in the chat. Ali, it's really interesting. Thank you for your comment that you spent your early nursing career in Australia and that you're shocked of the low social class with which nurses are held in the UK. I just wanted to um, really let you all know, in case you're not aware, that in March in the new year, we will launch the global arm of FNF. And as part of that, we seek to do a lot more work internationally. And I think in that sense, Ali, it'd be lovely to chat with you further. And one of the things we're very much looking at is what can we, we all learn globally um, from all aspects of nursing midwifery. Um, so we're very much interested in getting into that zone and please do feel uh, free to be in touch with us we've got a new director of global uh, called Stuart Tuckwood who'd uh, love to have as many conversations as possible but yeah we do launch the global work of FNF in the new year so please do all watch this space 
And I think, as you clearly pointed out, Ali, there's lots that we can learn across borders as well as across disciplines. Leanne, I'm just going to check in to see if we might have you back. Can you hear me? Yes. I just had to you. leave and come back. It was saying I was unmuted, so I'm not sure what happened there, but um, I should be oh. back now. So I don't know if there's any a more questions. More, yeah, a couple more, if that's okay, just quickly. So Grace has asked, what do we call our male nurses? And says most of us call ourselves sister. And I think, you know, just making that point about language and terminology. I think that's an interesting one. It comes up quite a lot, actually. So in Scotland, we don't have the term sister or mate, and we just have charge nurse or clinical nurse manager. It's not language that we use, but I don't personally see it as inherently problematic. It's part of our history and culture. And I suppose my concern would be about if we shift things for men to make them more comfortable with the idea of having to use the term sister, we're almost saying, actually, it's OK for you to be uncomfortable with being referred to in a female term rather than actually what is wrong with being called sister it's not inherently because you're female it's because that's the historic title if that makes sense thanks Leanne I think that those feelings are echoed um in the following comments in the chat so thank you so much uh, to another Leanne and Laura for commenting on that too um, and also Sakina I can see you've just made a comment on the gendered natures of titles too so thank you um, are there any more questions from anybody? Um, I think, Leanne, you've been absolutely fantastic. Um, and Thank you'll you. see now uh, lots of comments coming in to say to say the same. Um, Leanne, if I might, I might ask one last question from us all on, on behalf of FNF, if that's OK, which is that, yes. you know, as I'm, I hope you all know, having been here today, that we very much seek to represent you as professions. And that is absolutely in our constitution as a charity that we're here to um, represent the, the nursing and midwifery professions and also to elevate the voices of those in the professions. So um, without, obviously, uh, there's only so much we can all do, but Leanne, what, what would you like to see an organisation like FNF do in this arena, please? So I would say, um... I could talk all day about the job that I do. We're very niche and quite a new specialism as gender-based violence nurses. But I see the value of that every single day in terms of coordinating care and support for survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence as well, FGM, anything under that umbrella. I would say to any organisation that supports nurses that having, I guess, that voice in this arena from a nursing perspective is really important. The agenda for gender-based violence isn't strictly that of nurses and our, our voice can become very quickly lost in that. So I think there's definitely value in support to develop a new and existing specialisms and the voice of those specialisms in a national and global sense. I think that's always gonna be really helpful so that those specialisms don't get swallowed up by the wider medical narrative. Amazing. If that answers your question. That absolutely does. Thank you very much indeed. And I think a, a great comment in the chat box from Sakina now is just to say, great to have a professional and open discussion too. And I think that certainly echoes, Leanne, what we would all say to you, that it's been absolutely fascinating to hear your presentation, really thought provoking. And thank you so much for being so honest and open with your comments and your reflections and we really appreciate it and once again really this is just to say to you all who've attended today thank you so much for coming we appreciate um now as always but obviously particularly so that your time is so precious precious and pressured um, and we really appreciate you taking the time out today to be with us to talk about this important issue please do stay in touch with fnf on uh, our social channels and through email and please feel free to get in touch with any of the team who are here today um, and thank you I can just see another Leanne commenting it would be great for FNF to consider communication workshops and escalating despite the patriarchy um, thank you Leanne we shall certainly take that away too and um, so thank you so much to you all it's three o'clock so we shall let you all go um, but it's been absolutely fantastic and we will be in touch on email with follow-up from today so thank you all and have a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week. Thanks so much.